So, you know, it was a story as old as cars themselves. Tried to do something cool, ended up breaking it. Here we are. This is back in 2017, right after we got the truck going for the first time. This is from Christmas Day 2023. I wanted to recreate that first burnout, but I put a little Christmas tree in the bed because I thought that would be funny. All right, I'm going to put this at the beginning of the video because I think this is the probably the most important or most useful info in this entire deal. So this is the booklet that came with the gear set because this I bought all this stuff through Yukon. And this booklet has some info in it. I mean, it's decently helpful. But as far as uh, figuring out how to make shim changes and whatnot, this is, I mean, it doesn't have a whole lot of, whole lot of info on that. Mostly you just have these little pictures to go off of. And just for me, the way my brain works, this did not help me. This is what I was using when I was basically just running figure eights around the problem. And I was spending weeks trying to get this diff set up right. So this, the way that I think, really didn't help me much and made this a bit of a struggle. So I bought this book. There you can see the guy who wrote it. This book has a lot of really good information in it. It goes real in-depth. I mean, not in-depth on any specific differential because this is just a generic kind of all-around book. But it has a lot of information on differentials. It has it includes uh, talking about gear ratios, tire sizes, I think. It also has a section on U-joints and drive shafts. And more importantly for me, just the way that I think, this really helped me. Instead of having a bunch of pictures, which this book does have pictures of patterns in it and it's a lot better than what that little pamphlet had but important for me this book explains and shows how different shim changes will move the pattern across the tooth that was what finally got me through this project after i went through this book and understood all of that info i think i had i think i spent maybe a little less than a day and then i had the diff set up enough where i was happy with it so Anyways, it, this is this whole deal is my first time trying to set up a diff. So if it's your first time trying to set up a diff or you're just not super confident in what you're doing or how shim changes are going to affect the pattern, I recommend this book. There might be better ones out there. I don't know. But I had really good luck with this one, and I really liked this book. And, I mean, I'm not going to show the info in the book just because as far as I'm concerned, this dude and everybody else involved in this book definitely earned the money off of it. So if you need the info, I just recommend buying the book. It was definitely a worthwhile investment for me. So the damage assessment here is every gear in it is trashed. Hopefully the bearings are fine. But when I get this apart, what I expect I'm going to find is that this was always an open diff. I thought this was a part-time limited slip where it has clutch packs behind these gears right here so that whenever they're under load it pushes the gears apart engages the clutch pack and it's called a part-time limited slip because you have to have traction on enough traction on both wheels to actually engage it so that's what i thought it had my dad thought it had a limited slip because when he was driving this thing back in the day he had situations where this thing would spin both tires fine i thought it was a limited slip because i've had situations like this with it And if you look closely in that clip, you'll note that one tire was spinning by itself. And then after doing that for a little bit, key word, after doing that for a little bit, then the other one came in. 
what I think was actually happening with this diff the whole time, and I know this diff, I'm pretty sure this diff has been rebuilt before, maybe, it, I mean, I think it has, just based on what I found the last time I took it apart. But what I think was actually happening with this thing is potentially this gear, for sure this one down here, had been friction welding themselves to the pin long, 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 long time ago which was making this thing act like a limited slip because after it, you know, has to do its deal for a little while, then it seemed like it locked up and wanted to be a limited slip. And I think that limited slip might have just been the gear welding itself to the pin. We'll get it out and look at it closer, but I mean, you can see that pin. That is absolute carnage. There is no way that happened in that weak little burnout attempt I did. Is look at all this oil running out of here. I put new axle seals in this. The passenger side pretty much went to leaking from day one, and evidently this side was leaking too, because as soon as I pulled the backing plate off, I got oil running out of it. Also a part of that deal was these custom axles. These are made by a company called Dutchman Axles, and they turned out really, really good. I think they pretty much make them from step one, and I'm pretty happy with them. They have turned out really, really good, and it's a, it's, this at least is a, I mean, it's pretty much the same as the factory. I just had to get a different bolt pattern, went to a five lug, a later style five lug pattern from the six lug that it was originally. But this Dana 44 is pretty stout. I mean, this is pretty much the same spec as the original axles and they're 30 spline axles, if I remember right. So they're pretty good. Well, except for that bit, the, uh, the spider gears weren't great. So at least in my case, the top of the number faces the ring gear. Also worth noting, this cap says A61 or something to that nature. And the other cap says A63. Well, I was getting ready for the fight of my life getting this thing out of here. Uh, you can see the uh, yoke tool has made a reappearance. And I had this set up where I was going to stand on this, take that hammer, and start thrashing around on that crowbar. Because at this point, the carrier is a total loss. That is not the correct way of getting it out, but that is a way of getting it out. You're supposed to have a spreader deal that clips into these holes and stretches this cast housing. But I realistically am never going to find one of those, nor do I really need one, per se. So... We're going to try this method until it doesn't work. All right, that took way more effort to get apart than I thought it was going to be. At one point, I even had this set up on a tractor implement with a four-pound hammer wailing away on it. But my theory, I think, is pretty much proven now. If you take a look, there is no place for clutches in this diff. This was, is, was, always was an open differential. So this thing was finding a way to generate enough friction to lock up and occasionally drive the passenger wheel in addition to the driver wheel. So looking at the carnage here, that's really the only thing that got the ring gear, unfortunately. One, one chip and the, the ring gear's done. This is actually the piece of the spider gear that did the ring gear in. This was jammed way up in here. That spider gear has got two teeth left. That one's got a few more, but it's pretty rough. The interesting failure here is the pin. Look at how much was worn, melted down, and then welded back to this side of the pin. I mean, that's, that's on there. I can't just flake that off of there. So the gear and the pin absolutely welded themselves together and then it exploded also why i was having such a hard time getting this guy out is the pin had spun you know that roll pin was never going to hold that torque and i don't know why it didn't occur to me earlier but this guy spun around in the carrier so the roll pin wasn't actually even doing anything but yeah that did not happen in my little burnout attempt i'm not going to say it wasn't my fault but I didn't cause all of this. <laughs> this happened a long time ago. If you notice, it actually broke the pin down here. This 
it broke it right in the middle of where the other gear rides. So I think that's what saved this gear and why it didn't explode is because it probably welded itself to this guy and then was able to freewheel a little bit. Whereas the other one was still locked in long enough to explode is my guess. So lesson learned. I didn't take this apart the first time because you have to undo this ring gear in order to get that pin out. And at the time, that was a little more daunting than I wanted to mess with. I didn't see a reason to take this apart. And lesson learned. Even if there's not a reason to take it apart, if you're in there, just take it all the way down, look at everything, make sure it's all good. Otherwise, you have stuff like this hiding. All right, deep breath. For reasons I don't understand, this bearing lost its press fit, so it pretty much fell off. And I used a little etching tool to scratch a P into this and this so that I don't get the race and the bearing mixed up. Now we got this apparatus here, which is what I used the first time I pulled the bearings off this carrier. And it was sketchy then, and it's sketchy now, but we'll see if it'll pull it off. All right, it's been three weeks since I worked on this because I ended up hurting myself while working on this. So I'm going to do a little bit of a public service announcement here for an injury that you potentially didn't know about. So what had happened is I bought this cheap puller to pull the pinion bearing off of the pinion, and it was too thick in order to grab the bearing without tearing up the cage. So I was using the flap disc on the grinder, and I was trimming all this down so that it would fit under the cage of the bearing without tearing it up. In the process of doing that, I had the grinder in this hand and I went and I sat the grinder down. I was looking at the workpiece, not what I was doing. And when I pulled my hand away, I ended up bumping this knuckle right here into the flap disc, which, I mean, that was three weeks ago. The cut has completely healed. I mean, it was a bit of a stretch to even call it a cut. I mean, really, it was just a bad scratch. But it even three weeks later, I don't have the full range of motion out of it yet. So what had happened was, is you have tendons that run all through your hands and on your fingers that make them move. So you have one on the inside that makes it do that way, and then the one on the top makes it straighten back out. And that grinding disc, or that flap disc, happened to hit exactly where that tendon is. I mean, it's really a freak deal that it even happened to begin with. Because if that would have happened, I mean, anywhere else on my hand, really, it wouldn't have been a problem. But it just hit right there where that tendon is. And those tendons apparently have zero tolerance for any kind of abuse. So, moral of the story is wear gloves and don't be an idiot. All right, medical update. Uh, that's a piece of grinding disc that was in my finger. That is why, well, that's the large reason of why that hurt so bad. So that took three weeks for it to start to find its way out. The more you know. So with that, here's where we're at with this. I've tied everything together with the shims that were with it. I mean, this realistically is not gonna go together with these shims and be right. I just was trying to keep everything together. So I had a reference point and I went through, I inspected the races, all the races looked good. And one of them had kind of a slightly weird wear pattern to it where you could see the wear mark on the race got a little narrower and a little wider in one spot. But I was told that wasn't an issue, so we're just going to let it ride. Other than that, I mean, there really was no concern with the bearing races and I checked every single roller. I marked the cage as a starting point and then rotated every roller all the way around a few times and looked over every single one of them and I didn't find any signs of trauma from debris getting through the bearings. So I think I got it stopped quick enough before any debris passed through the bearings since there doesn't seem to be any damage. So what we have here for replacement parts is this is a Yukon center section. So it has a full-time limited slip in it. So I gotta get the carrier bearings put on here. I think I'm probably just going to put it together with the shims as the other one was and just 
see how that fits. Here's the setup I used to push the bearings back on. So random dots and cross member scraps. And this is one of the original bearings. Well, or at least it was one of the bearings that came out of the diff when I went through it four years ago. The guy who helped me do this used this piece to press these bearings onto the other carrier. And I thought that was pretty clever, so I saved it. And now I'm using it again. All right, here's the setup. So I need 10 of these little sleeves to take up the gap between the, the ring gear bolts that I have and the carrier. So to buy these, it's I think $8 a piece if I go through Yukon. So I found one as cheap as like four or something a piece, but basically with shipping and tax and everything, I'm gonna be spending about $100 on these cheap little sleeves. So I went to Lowe's where a unsettling amount of my car parts come from. Bought a bunch of these little guys. Uh, they're half inch outer diameter, three eighths inner diameter. I forget the length. Uh, sorry, no, they were, they were one and a half inch long. So I should be able to get three sleeves out of one of these and they were $1.50 a piece. The trick is I gotta cut them down and I don't have any kind of precision bandsaw or lathe that can cut these. The best I have is the drill press. And this is how I shortened the screwed up tie rod ends on the Dotson. That's in the video about the front end of it. But exact same concept as I did there. I have a bolt which is holding this piece and adapting it to the chuck. I have this hacksaw, which is perfect for this because it has this lip on the inside of it and this flat piece here. That is what allows, allows me to square this thing up pretty good in this vise. I tried this with a narrower hacksaw and it just, it would never work. The whole thing just kept flopping around. So it's gotta be a pretty robust hacksaw, ideally with some kind of a flat face on it so that you can square it up. So the table, I set the height on the table and the drill press here. And the only thing that moves is the table swivels. Nothing else moves, everything else is locked down. And you wanna cut on, so the other thing, depending on how you have the table set up, in my case here, I need to have the blade flipped around where it's cutting on the pull stroke because the drill press rotates this way. And then in my, app, in my case here, I need to cut on this half of the blade because if you cut on this, and if you have it set up like this and you cut on this lower half, it as soon as the saw bites, it wants to rip the saw into the material really hard and you gotta be on top of it, otherwise you're gonna break the blade. It'll still wanna do that up here on this side of the blade, but it's much, much more controllable. So anyways, I got the drill, the drill press on its lowest setting. I'm just putting transmit, uh, some used transmission fluid on it just as a lubricant every now and then. And you just gently, I kind of just made a little score mark with it. Got the, got the micrometer, dial caliper, whatever up in there. Made sure that I was where I wanted to be. And then I just slowly just start cutting away at it. it takes forever, but it is making a pretty good cut. All right, the next step in what I'm doing here is I got all these cut and they fit just a little loose in this half inch hole because of the clearance built into these holes and I don't really care for that. So I'm gonna try a trick that I did on the lift arm bushings of the Jubilee a while back. And I took my sleeves and I put three tack welds on them, which I'll have to grind down here in a minute. But before I do that, I'm fixing the inner diameter of the hole because I don't know if it, I mean, cutting it definitely pushed a little material in and welding it might've distorted it a little bit too. So I'm just running a drill bit through them to clean them up so that the bolt goes through it easy. And I made this very intricate and complex jig. I uh, just clamped two pieces of wood together in the vise and drilled a hole at the seam. So that way I can load one of these in here, clamp it together without bending this, but where it's tight enough to actually grab it, and then I can gently run the drill bit through it to clean it. And here is phase three. 
three of this project, I think. So I'm using my uh, my custom high precision, a lot of thought put into it, bolt tool that I was using earlier to cut all of these pieces out. I have everything rigged up in here with a washer on either end as a stop. And so I need to file down these welds a decent bit because you can see they stick out rather violently. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that real quick. I really need to patent this tool because it does a third thing. I can use it as an installer. All right, I think that hurdle has been overcome. So I got them all pressed in here. And then I went over both sides with a hand file and made sure that there was no, no part of these sleeves sticking up. There was a few of them that I really had to file down because they were a little bit thicker than they should have been. And then I had to go back through again and drill these out. So why didn't I just buy a set? Well, one, that's another $100 to throw at this. And two, I probably would have had to wait another, realistically, a week before I could get back to this. So I would have lost $100 and a week. And I've spent probably about half a day, maybe a little more than half a day on making all of these sleeves. So I'm ahead on money and time because making these sleeves cost me like $5, $5 in parts and a single 3 8 bolt that I ruined. But the other reason that I don't care is I don't get a whole lot of enjoyment from just buying parts and putting them in. I like trying to figure out how to do stuff with what I have. And this was a perfect example of trying to do something with what I had at my disposal. So I enjoy that a whole lot more than just buying parts and putting them on. I like actually trying to solve problems and, you know, build stuff myself. So the ring gear's installed. I went ahead and torqued it down. Per the book that came with the ring and pinion, I torqued it to 55 foot-pounds. So this was just my way of doing it. As on my first pass, I just did kind of a random star pattern, but on my first pass, I put one mark and went and did them all. And then on my next pass, I put another mark to make an X. So X means that every single one of them got hit twice. And then just for good measure, I went and hit every single one of them again just to make sure. Uh, since custom tools are the name of this project, here's one. This is actually something for an old Springfield riding mower I have. Something my dad and I built. This is actually part of a garage door opener. But sticking two bolts in the end of it, this is how I was grabbing the carrier and it made torquing it a whole lot easier. I didn't have I didn't have to find it, uh, a way of clamping on to the carrier. It's just a piece of metal, two bolts in it slot it into the extra set of holes that's not being used, and that was a really easy way of grabbing the carrier so that I could torque it. Forgot to mention, I also used blue Loctite on all of the ring gear bolts. Pretty sure I talked about a lot of this the first time I went through this diff, but I wanted to go over it again just because I think it's interesting. So there was a lot of thought put into oil control and this differential and pretty much every differential. So the only thing that's moving in here, obviously, is the carrier and the pinion. So in order to effectively pump oil through the diff, the ring gear itself is effectively the oil pump. It sits in here, flings around, picks up oil from the bottom of the diff, and that's why the cover, the cover on most diffs has such a nice radius to it, because that it helps the carrier or the ring gear carry that oil around the diff and throw it towards the pinion bearings. So a lot, that's why a lot of those aftermarket diff covers, you know, they're just the, the square box basically. That's kind of why those suck because you create a mess of oil back here. Do you need something? And then you create a mess of oil up here before it can actually get to the pinion bearings. So that's why the cover's curved the way it is. So the oil, after making it over the cover gets shot down in here. So this passage, uh, I can't reach all the way in there. This passage opens up right in here in this kind of this cavity 
between the inner and outer pinion bearings. So the oil gets thrown in there, and then there's a control, I don't know what you want to call it, a metering device, effectively, for both pinion bearings. So this one, in this case, would sit down there, something like that. So it, part of it is it also kind of acts as a shim, but this guy here is basically a dam. So it, it forces the oil level to get this high in that cavity before the oil can run through the bearing and out. So what that does is it helps make sure that enough oil is getting to the front pinion bearing. Otherwise, you could potentially just have all your oil running out through this, this inward pinion bearing and nothing getting to the, the front pinion bearing. So you filled up this cavity in here with oil. You now have oil flowing into over and into this pinion bearing, or at the very least, you're letting oil flow through the front pinion bearing. So from there, once it gets through the front pinion bearing, there's another passage that it drops down into, and that oil will come out right here, back down towards the ring gear to get picked up again. So that's how that works. Now this has sealed wheel bearings, axle bearings, whatever you want to call them. So because of that, it doesn't have anything special to throw oil down the axle tubes. A lot of diffs do. They'll have a little wrinkle right here in the cover that helps catch oil and shoot it off to the side. This one doesn't have that because it doesn't need it. So this bearing here, I think, is going to be primarily lubed by whatever's flying off the carrier. Kind of the same story with these guys. I mean, I think there's enough craziness going up on up here as the oil's you know having to change directions just a little bit that it it blasts off and catches both of these carrier bearings but anyways i just wanted to point that out just because this could seem like an insignificant piece but i believe it is a very significant piece so i think that the whole point of that was basically just before you go modifying something try and think about why was it the way it was before because a lot of stuff like this little guy and the shape of the diff cover, somebody put a lot of thought into and they made it the way they did for a reason. So, anyways. All right, so I got that race knocked in. That actually went pretty good. So I saved the old races from this diff for stuff such as this. Well, I didn't plan on ever being back in this diff again, but here we are. Anyways, I didn't have an actual bearing installer big enough, but the bearing installer I did have fits into this old race really good and then I just held it in I just lined it up right on top of the good race and tapped it in like that since I pretty confident I didn't show this earlier these little notches you can see there's on that inner race there's another pair that's how you drive the old races out is you take something and stick it where that notch is so that you're on the back side of the race and then you just hit back and forth and that's how you drive the race out. If nobody's ever done this, I recommend uh, looking at somebody else's videos who actually knows what they're doing. But also, you can tell whenever it's seated because the hammer bounces back different. So whenever you're driving it in, every time you hit it, you know, I try to use a mallet or something, but if that just isn't doing it, then I'll use a small hammer. That should be all it takes, or anything I've ever done, that's all it's took. So, if the hammer bounces back whenever you finally bottom the race out, because as you hammer it in, the race is moving, but as soon as the race bottoms out and there's nowhere for it to go, the hammer bounces back. I mean, it's, it's, real, it's real noticeable. It bounces back a lot harder than it does before. So it'll sound different. The hammer bounces back a lot harder. That's how you know that the race is actually seated. All right, the pinion bearing is pressed back on. I used, again, the inner race from the old bearing from whenever I went through this diff the first time. The problem with this guy is it still got into the press fit part just a little bit, so then I had to put the bearing puller on here and pull it back off. A uh, way you can get around that is you can get in here with something and bring the inner diameter out just a little bit, but I don't do this enough to really justify that time investment. So I got this bearing seated, so now I can get the pinion in the diff and we can start looking at what is the gear mesh going to look like.
compared to a lot of other diffs, especially like the, the truck 12 bolt, is a lot of those diffs have a crush sleeve in here. This one doesn't have that though, so I all I have to worry about is these shims. So I believe the deal with this guy is, so it's gonna go up in there like that, and I think, my guess is as the diff rotates, this guy helps grab oil and throw it down this, this return passage, whatever you wanna call it, because if you notice, it is offset. So I'm guessing as this is rotating, this disc helps grab that oil and throw it down this passage here to try and get it back to the ring gear quicker. That's my guess. I'm just going to put it back the way that I took it apart and hope that past me did the same thing. So because I'm an idiot, I lost a whole bunch of progress last night. Well, didn't really lose any progress. I just didn't make any. Because in my tired state, I got these shims in the wrong spot. I kept putting the shims between the yoke and the bearing and then wondering why the preload was too tight. The shims were supposed to be going right here between the pinion shaft and the bearing. So once I got that figured out, then I'm back on making progress. But if you're having to set one of these up, so I got lucky the first time, I guess, because this old pinion shaft doesn't have a press fit. As you can see, bearing just drops right on it. Now there's no play in the bearing, but it's it's a snug, it's a real tight fit without it being an interference fit. We'll put it that way. So that is super nice for trying to set this up because this shaft has a pretty aggressive interference fit with the pinion bearing. And so once you get it set up and then you find out your shims are wrong, the only thing I could do was take this nut, which this is a aftermarket nut, but it has this flange on it, which was really nice. And then I could put a socket on top of that and the socket was grabbing that flange and I could, I could use a light hammer to try and gently tap it out. And I would spin, I'd spin the pinion a little bit every single time just so it wasn't hammering the rollers into the same part of the race every single time. Didn't like that though. Didn't like doing that. So what I ended up doing is this is one of the original bearings from the last time I re, well, from the last time I was in this diff. And what I did is I just took a, a die grinder, a pneumatic, whatever you want to call it. And I, I opened up the inner diameter just a little bit. So it falls on there like so. And that is going to make doing shim changes so much easier because you're not having to beat this thing or press it out of there. You can just push it in and out of there by hand because the bearing no longer has that interference fit. So if you don't have an extra bearing, it might be worth it just to go. Well, that's the other deal. It's got to be the same bearing. So this is, well, it's hard to see. This is an old Timken and the set I replaced it with was Timken. So as long, I think as long as you stay with the same manufacturer, they should be pretty close. So that's the, that's the caveat there is if you're going to buy an extra one to do that with. Uh, it probably needs to be the exact same brand, same part number, same everything. Okay, so I got this with the correct bearing torqued up in there. Everything good. The uh, yoke wrench, whatever you want to call it, was pretty helpful. I put a really long handle on it, so I don't even have to hold it. I just let it rest against the ground. The nut, uh, per the instructions, I put some anti-seize on the back flange of the nut, not the threads, but the flange of the nut so it doesn't gall up against the yoke. And I torqued it to 150 foot-pounds because that is all my torque wrench will do. It's supposed to be like 200 or something crazy like that. I'd be lying if I said several weeks hadn't passed. I have taken this diff apart no less than 15 times. I mean, it has been a struggle trying to get this thing set up right. So what I was told is that a Dana diff, just with how they're set up with the shims on the insides of the bearings and everything, and how that pinion bearing up there is pressed on, what I was told is that because of all that, these are about as bad as it gets to set up. And I believe that. And frankly, if there's a diff that's worse than these to set up, I hope I never see one because this has been quite frustrating. 
but I think I finally made some progress. So the big thing that I've been fighting with this is if I change the backlash, it radically changes the pattern. So right out of the gate, I had a really good pattern on here, but the backlash was too much and I just moved the carrier a few thousands and it screwed up the pattern. And then ever since then, I've just been basically chasing my own tail, trying to get the pinion depth right so the pattern's right, but trying to get the backlash right, which then screws up the pattern. And it's just been a struggle. And I'm tired of buying shims. And what I ended up actually having to do is I took some heavy duty uh, aluminum, aluminum foil, tin foil, whatever, and used an existing shim. And I traced out uh, on the foil with a razor blade and basically made my own shims because the foil I was using was about 1.1 thousandth of an inch thick. And what that allowed me to do is just slowly start moving the carrier towards the pinion to try and get the preload and the backlash right because the smallest shims I could find were 10 thousandths each and no combination of 10, 15, 20 thousandths shims would, would get this even close to what it is now. But now I've got the backlash pretty good. So there's, so it's right at about 80 thousandths. Comes up to just over 8 thousandths. I was looking for between six to 10. So the backlash is finally in spec. So now I can check the pattern again, and I'm just hoping that the pattern is actually good and we can actually start making some progress on this. So here's the problem I got now. That little witness mark there at the base of the tooth. That is where the gears are contacting hard enough to squeeze all the marking compound out of the way. So I just used a paint marker marked this section. This is whenever this problem first showed up, so I have a point of reference. Pretty, pretty decent sized witness mark. So I pulled a little bit of pinion shim out of it. Still got a mark, much smaller mark, no mark. There's a good one, but it's not as big. And I just went ahead and marked a few of these just for reference. And the mark's getting smaller compared to this attempt. I really don't know how many times I've taken this diff apart and put it back together. I'm guessing it's no less than 15 to 20 times. The, uh, I cannot believe this literal pile of garbage is actually still doing the job. I broke it once and had to put new nuts on it because I stripped out the one that was on there. I mean, it's, it's struggling, but it got through this project. I think I finally got this figured out. Something I remembered while editing this video is I got such a crisp, clear mark out of this attempt by propping the diff up where I could grab the ring gear 
with a gloved hand and then I put a breaker bar on the pinion nut instead of just trying to grab the yoke by hand. By doing that, I was able to put a whole lot more force onto the ring and pinion and that made the mark a lot more clear. So here's the pattern on the drive side. Looks to be a nice little oval shaped pattern pretty much right in the middle of the tooth this way. It's definitely biased a little bit towards the heel, but it's nowhere near running off the edge of the heel, so I think it'll be pretty good. It's only slightly, slightly towards the heel, so I think I'm good on that front. And I was able to fix, see on my other attempts, I kept having this problem right here where the teeth were meshing way too much and the pinion was actually bottoming out in the ring gear, I was able to fix that. And the only way I could get it to quit doing that is I have the backlash set just a little bit loose. The, the spec per the, the manufacturer was a upper limit of 10 thousandths, and I currently have it set at about 11, assuming, you know, assuming this guy is actually accurate. I'm about 1 thousandth too loose. But that's got to be better than the teeth doing this, because every other adjustment I made just made everything worse. And then on the coast side, you got a nice little kind of diamond-shaped pattern there. Pretty well centered in the tooth both directions. Again, a little bit towards the heel, but I feel good about it. More importantly though, the drive side looks really good to me. So I'm gonna go ahead and take everything apart one last time. I'm gonna give this thing a really thorough cleaning just cause there's all kinds of fine metal shavings and stuff in it from pushing the carrier in, pulling the carrier out and doing all that stuff. So I'm gonna take it apart, make sure all the bearings are clean, clean everything. And from there I can put in the correct outer pinion bearing and get rid of the mock-up one get the preload on the pinion set right, and then should be able to button this thing up for good. All right, seal's in, the good bearing is in, it's pressed onto the shaft. This guy's torqued and has Loctite on it. That was supposed to be in there. I will say though, being an idiot and having to do things twice does give you some opportunities to refine the process such as putting this together, forget the seal the first time. Put the shims in, put that whatever slinger deal in, put the bearing on, use the yoke to press the bearing onto the pinion shaft. Then you can pull the yoke back off and the pinion won't try to fall out of the diff. Then you can real easily just stand the diff up, hammer the seal in without the pinion trying to fall out. Then you can put the yoke on for real. That worked pretty good. So as far as the nut, I put a little, just a little bit of anti-seize on the back side of it, just so it wasn't binding up on the yoke, just so that way it got a better torque reading. And as is evident by all the blue on everything, I absolutely smothered this thing six ways to Sunday and locked tight. So that ought to be good. And for checking the preload, just have one of these cheap little deals. Just reads in inch pounds. Uh, I can't believe this is the way you're supposed to do this because it's not really that great if I'm honest. But I want the rolling, per the, the deal, the book I have, I want the rolling resistance less than 10, which it seems to be. So it's supposed to be somewhere 6 to 10 inch pounds. So it seems like it's just under 10, so we'll call that good. And that's for used bearings because these are used bearings. You want to make sure you have enough preload because that actually forces the bearing to sit correctly and makes it stronger, makes it last longer than if it you know, has enough play that it can walk around into an unideal condition. But if you get it too tight, then you just burn the bearings out of it. So I definitely wouldn't want it to be any tighter than this, but it's within spec, so we'll see how it goes. I think I forgot to mention, I did put a little bit of RTV on the inside splines of the yoke. 
That way, oil can't weep between the yoke and the pinion. Well, here's another good aftermarket parts strike again. I got all this together. It's all sealed up. I was feeling good about it. Just before I left for the night, I went to go turn the yoke just to feel good about it one more time. And it was completely locked down. Can't tell you how much my heart sank at that. But the only thing I had done different is I put the cover on it. And if I take this fill plug, just back it off a little bit. Now we're happy again. So that carrier assembly is way bigger than the factory one to the point that this fill plug will hit it before the fill, the fill plug actually seals. So that's an issue. Uh, I guess the only thing I can try really is taking this fill plug out and cutting some of this extra thread off because it doesn't have much thread engagement there. So I think I can get away with cutting a decent bit of this off. But there you can see the carrier. I mean, it's, it's right there. You can see where the fill plug was hitting on it earlier. So there is the uh, hopefully only problem that this diff was going to have. And once this is fixed, hopefully it's smooth sailing. So I think I have one more problem I got to deal with here before I can put all this together. As evident by the oil that is still standing on top of the bearing, both sides had leaking axle seals. And what happened is as the oil leaked through, it went through this seal into the bearing and out the other seal in order to actually leak out all over the ground. So it didn't leak that bad, which is why I never messed with it. But one thing I don't like is you can see on the outside of the bearing is not really gear oil. It's not really grease either. I think as the gear oil got into the bearing, it broke down and messed up the grease that was inside the bearing. So per the recommendation of the company I bought the axles and these bearings from, I took just two picks, these little guys, real, real sharp on the end, and very, very delicately and carefully, I was able to pop the seal out of it. It's got a slight bend to it. Hopefully that won't be a problem. But I got the seal pulled off. I sprayed it out with carb cleaner real good, so that way I can pack some new grease into the bearing. I don't want to over pack it, but uh, I can put some new grease in it and hopefully hopefully it'll be good. Because I was worried that the grease that was in there would be messed up from the oil. And if it's not continually getting oil going to it the way it was before, maybe it would cause a problem. Well, here's something kind of wild to me. Four years ago, I bought these seals, I think, through an O'Reilly's. And I was going to go ahead and replace them because they both leak. Uh, the problem, I think, is that I didn't put any kind of sealer around the outside of the wheel seal. I just used whatever crap was on them. And whenever I hammered these out, I just had a big socket inside the axle tube. And I dented in this inner piece. Well, as it turns out, no store, I mean, again, like four different parts, parts chains, no store has one of these seals within 150 miles of me. Because of that, I'm going to go ahead and try reusing these because I don't think the seal itself was the problem. I uh, just used a little pair of pliers and bent this inner piece back out so that it's not touching the rubber seal. And the seal itself... Both of them still look in really good shape, so I'm just going to put some RTV around the outside of them and put them back in, and we'll see if it's any better. Okay, so the diff's in it. This is the plug. I cut probably a quarter inch off of it. I just used a Sawzall with a metal cutting blade, and it cut really, really easy. So I put some grease on there, threaded it all the way in, and no grease was left on the carrier, so I think I got good clearance now. I uh, went ahead and got a set of new U-bolts for it, since apparently you're not supposed to reuse those. Not sure what difference it really makes. But one of them, one of the ones original to this truck was really, really rusted. 
down here from, I guess something got built up around it and just rotted it away. So I just went ahead and replaced all of them. So should be good on that front. The brakes are hooked back up. And oh, so the U-bolts, I had to get these ones made because places like LMC don't even list the U-bolt that this truck needs. Because apparently this truck is pretty uncommon in the fact that it's a half ton 67 to 72 that obviously has rear leaf springs instead of the coil spring setup. So apparently that is extremely uncommon on the half ton trucks. So I guess it was ordered with that. And then another weird deal is that carrier bearing right there, that big giant massive thing. They used that carrier bearing all the way up through one ton trucks. And I don't even think, I don't know. I think you had to get a three quarter ton Chevy to get that carrier bearing because the half ton carrier bearings that the Chevys use are really, really flimsy and cheap. So I don't know, this truck's interesting. It's got, I, I don't know how, there's really no way of figuring out how it was ordered, but I'm kind of guessing that it was special ordered with the rear leafs and, you know, the upgraded carrier bearing. I don't know if that was a package or if it would have had to have been individually ordered, but anyways, I'm going to go ahead and get everything, get the drain plug sealed up, go ahead and put some oil in this thing. And I guess we'll see how happy it is. So I thought this might be a good idea. I left it running here and I uh, carefully crawled under the backside so I wouldn't get sucked under the tire and listened around on the diff with the stethoscope and it sounds pretty happy. So I think I am, uh, I mean, I'm still stressed about it, but I think I'm to the point, I gotta put some load on it and see what it's gonna do. I don't like doing multi-part videos, but this one's already way too long. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut it off here. And the next video, we're gonna be going through the braking procedure on the diff, hopefully not having any problems, and then seeing if the truck can regain its honor from its last burnout attempt.